are my strength when months of Baptists to put their hands up and praise. Oh, I tell you, I wish I could sometimes. I see Helen do that. Sorry to tattle on her. But I see her raise her hands up there, praise the Lord. Oh, I'm doing it in my mind, though. I can tell you that. I'm doing it in my mind. Pastor. Thank you for that. Let's pray together. God, it's been a blessed evening. We pause to praise you for that and certainly pause to thank you for your word. We love you and we love your word, the book. We love the Holy Spirit of God who faithfully turns the light on for us and then is eager to help us to apply uh, the truth of the word to our lives. It's an amazing process and again, we stand in awe of it and and yet, uh, we, we can conduct our lives in such a way so that uh, we quench and grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And so, there's a tremendous challenge even in this. We need not think long about how your truth applies to our lives. We're constantly recognizing that. We did so again this morning, and that's our anticipation tonight. We often are citing together as well that we are many times in a position to appreciate the orchestration of the Holy Spirit of God, and such is the case again tonight. In fact, uh, we've just sung a, a beautiful song, one that many of us know, and it's been a while since we've sung it, and, and there's one phrase in particular where we would sing to you and pray to you with uh, the idea that uh, we would not give up that very much comes into play with your message to us this, this evening. And so, once again, especially your humble servant, I'm in a position to appreciate uh, the way that everything comes together. So it's with anticipation that we open up the book and look forward to you teaching us. And so, that's our prayer, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our study in 2 Thessalonians uh, resumes. We come tonight to verse 5 of chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5. I'd like to begin reading with verse 1 and then read through the fifth verse. And so here we go as you have found that uh, text to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Follow along as I read, please. 
Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, or Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians and God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly in the love of every one of you all toward each other abounds. So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. And here's our verse 5. This is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Uh, you recall that the Apostle Paul, back in verses 3 and 4, commends uh, the church in Thessalonica for three things, for her faith, for her love, and for her patience or endurance or perseverance. Um, the Thessalonians' faith was growing exceedingly. The Thessalonians' love was abounding to all and their patience their endurance was holding up under any and all persecution and tribulation. We have already received these three things as measuring sticks. And we have some unfinished business in regard to the third thing. We, as I noted this morning, we have, uh, with our study in the evening as well, covered some turf. And so we've talked about their faith and we've talked about their love and we began to talk about their patience their endurance, and it's in this realm that we have a little bit of unfinished business, but in the same breath, I am reminding you that these are measuring sticks. And so all along through the course of our consideration of these things, we need to be asking God and to realize that we are doing so before God. We need to be asking God how we measure up in regard to these things, our faith, our love, our patience. I said to you in regard to the Thessalonians' patience, their perseverance, their endurance in and through persecution, I said to you last time we were together that this involved a lot more than mere survival. You might be surprised that you'd come uh, tonight and that I would be talking somewhat philosophically with you about the idea of survival. I'm wondering if you would think that through with me tonight. I know this, that what's being spoken of here of the church in Thessalonica in regard to their perseverance, that it involved a lot more than mere survival, that it was more than not just giving up. By the way, again, there's the song that we just sung where we recommitted ourselves to not quitting. My, my mind and heart go quickly to our men's encouragement conference, and that's the theme, that we would get together and allow the Spirit of God, using the Word of God, to instill in the hearts of the men of God courage so that we would not quit. But I believe that God wants us to take uh, God wants to take us a little bit further. That it's a lot more than just not quitting. God expects and deserves a lot more than our simply surviving. And so we need to glean from our text the, the depth of the truth here that the church wasn't simply surviving; it was much more than that. Uh, the reason why I am pursuing this with you is because of verse 5 I'm rereading. This is the manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which also ye suffer. I have some trivia for you that isn't so trivial. That's another good epitaph for me out there. The man who said time after time after time, I have some trivia for you that isn't so trivial. Of course, we're, we're, whenever we're dealing with the word of God, and that's what we're always dealing with, uh, we, we know that there's 
nothing trivial there. Have you noticed in your study of the Word of God that you've never come across the word survive in any of its forms? You've never come across the word survive in your study of the Bible. I looked at all the different forms of the word survive, survival, survivor. It's become a very popular term, and I need to be careful because I could get off on a tangent in regard to this. I guess I just want to personally say to you, we need to be careful in our use of the term because if we're, if we're not careful, we will quickly move into the realm of pride. And I think you understand that when I say that I, I could be in a position, you know, based upon uh, events that have unfolded in my life, I, I, could, I could stand before a group of people and with, with much pride say, I am a survivor. I'm not making implications for anyone else, and I'm certainly not making a judgment. And I know that, for instance, in the area of cancer, I mean, that's become very popular, and we look for that, and we're thankful for it, where someone would be able to say, I'm a cancer survivor. And I think most of the time when we hear that, sorry, I am going to take the tangent. I think most of the time when we hear that, the people have a, a right perspective. They, they have their head and heart on straight, and and they're certainly not being prideful. When they say, I'm a cancer survivor, they're saying, I'm, I'm a cancer survivor. Well, God's people would say, I'm a cancer survivor because of God. You know, but we also would say, I'm a cancer survivor because of good medical personnel, because of a good doctor, a good surgeon, you know, things like that. And so I, I fully recognize that. If I'm just noting with you, and this is a, with a view to human tendency, that it'd be so easy for us to stand up and say with pride, I'm a survivor. And that it could very much be separated from God. And so I'm a little bit concerned about that. So that's my tangent, but let me bring you back to this trivia that isn't so trivial. You've never come across the word survive in your study of the Bible. And I began to wonder why, and again, looking at all of its forms. And when you ask a question about a word, when you ask the question why in regard to a word, then you move into the science of etymology, which is, the, uh, which is dealing with the history of terms. There's nothing complicated, uh, you, you know, uh, about it, although there are people, obviously, that are very skilled and expertise in this realm, and we depend upon them. But you know this in regard to particular terms, that a term in and of itself has, has its own history. That's why there are times when we have a term and it functions in one realm at one given period of time, and it functions very much differently at, in another given period of time. In other words, and we would say this even in regard to some of the translations of the Bible that we use, that there are terms uh, again, in the translation, not in the original documents, but there are terms in the translation that have changed in meaning over the course of time, and so obviously we need to be careful about that. So etymology, when you ask the question, you know, why are we not finding the word survive or survivor or survival in the Bible, you would say from an etymological standpoint, well, maybe the word just wasn't in popular usage at the time of the translation. I can tell you, you guys are just thrilled about this. <laughs> but it, it's worth the trip. But I did a little bit of investigation in regard to that, and I can report to you that, that, that the word was very much available to, for instance, the King James uh, translators of 1611. In fact, the word was in existence uh, in all three of these realms. It was in existence in the Middle English. That was, it was being used in Middle English. It was in existence in the Old French and also the late Latin. And what that means is that the term was very much available to the translators, which means as they went back to the original language and they worked their way through both the Hebrew initially with the Old Testament and the Greek and the New, that they had the word survival very much available to them if they came across a Hebrew or Greek term where they said, boy, that's what that word means. So I'm asking again, why don't we have the word survival in our Bibles. But further, I had trouble coming up with even the concept, the idea of survival. I mean from a positive standpoint. Now, this is kind of neat, and listen, I will very much down the road appreciate your input as you are good students and you can pursue this, and perhaps 
I'm overlooking something, but I'm talking about a positive use of the word survival in the Bible. And I'm wondering, and I'm not being smarty Alec, uh, in regard to this, but I'm wondering if the reason why I had trouble coming up with even the concept of survival in the Bible is because it's not there. And I'm wondering if the reason why it's not there and this will make sense to you, thus worth the trip. I'm wondering if the reason why it's not there is because God's provisions in the lives of his sons and daughters always goes beyond the idea of survival. We just may have to think about that and process it. Does God's provisions, I'm asking, um, I, I'm asking uh, this rhetorically. Does God's provisions in your life ever just get you by? Now listen, I know that we can look at that, for instance, from a financial standpoint, and I know that we've all been in a position where we said, wow, I have a bill, and it's $23 this month, and guess what? God unexpectedly gave me exactly $23, and I fully understand that. I think I'm prompting you to look broadly at your life, and I also think that I'm prompting you to think again broadly about God's provisions especially with a view to his grace and mercy. And I'm asking you, if not every single time God impresses you with not only meeting your needs so that you're getting by, but where he impresses you with the abundance of his love, the abundance of his grace, the abundance of his mercy. You say, Pastor Tom, it seems like you're making a pretty big deal out of that. And let me, let me tell you in part why. If God paves the way for and thus anticipates that you and I would be living on a higher plane than that, in other words, that we'd be living lives that go beyond survival, then, wow, we're really, really responsible in this realm. And I personally believe that we do. I often hear this from the worldling. I keep my ears open, so to you. We're, we're engaging the worldling all the time, right? It's amazing the things that we hear from them. We want to continue to be prayerfully prepared for engaging the world. It, it is amazing how that God often orchestrates them saying something, even a single comment that paves a way for us to respond to that and to begin to at least impress them in, in part with the truth of God's word and the blessed gospel. How many times have you asked someone in the world how they're doing and they've said to you, well, I'm just keeping my head above water. Have you ever heard that before? Okay, boy, you guys are scaring me tonight. <laughs> my key worked, so, so far so good. I, we, we hear that an awful lot. W would you disagree? Would you be offended by me proposing that God deserves something better than that from God's people? I'm telling you tonight that God paves the way for and thus legitimately anticipates your and my living on a higher plane. And I'm here to testify to you tonight, and I've listened to your testimonies really for many, many years. I've never heard this from you. This is interesting to me. You've, you've come and we've come together and we've said at any given time because of our circumstances, we're, we've cried out and we've been open with each other and we've said, wow, I feel like I'm drowning and stuff like that, only to arrive at the place where God gives us full vision of what has taken place in our lives and now we're testifying, man, God not only uh, met my need, but he went way, way, way beyond the need. He showers us with his blessings. His grace and his mercy and his love are overflowing and even overwhelming to us. That's the way that God deals with us, and we're thankful for that. 
But I'm seeing now that God anticipates that that is going to be yet another part of my apologetic as I engage the worldling who is being very honest and saying, I'm just barely keeping my head above the water. And we would say, oh God, help me in some way to introduce him to the Savior because Christ really does make all the difference and we've sung it today. Christ is all that I need. Christ is my all and all. So again, you know, all this reflects back on our God. We just continue to become better theologians. We, we're coming to appreciate God better and to know him better and to, and to um, be aware of more fully his dealings with us. And it's just neat that we would be able to get together tonight and say, boy, God isn't just meeting our needs where we're getting by, but he continues to shower us with his good things. That's why, by the way, you keep on going. And that's why, although we are often confronted with stuff that initially knocks us on the seat of our pants, we invariably, with God's help, and we sung about it, he lifts us up and trains our eyes so that we are reminded of his perfect provision and the fact that I'm belaboring this, I know I am. I'm trying to convince you of something that you're probably already convinced of, but I just don't see that in the way you're looking at me. <laughs> wow, what a great God. So we have a biblical doctrine. So let me bring this back to the idea of survival and the reason why we don't find that as a theme in the word of God is because God does indeed pave the way for and thus anticipates our living on a higher plane. So here's the Thessalonians, they're in the process of being persecuted, and, rather, and here's the po biblical point. Rather than Paul citing this in regard to them, boy, they're just getting by. Boy, they're just barely keeping their head above water. We, we get the exact opposite from the Apostle Paul. He says, these folk are absolutely abounding through all the troubles and tribulations and persecutions that they are facing. So that brings us back to this topic, the idea that you and I would persist through our troubles, our tribulations, and especially our persecutions. By the way, God, we're just in kindergarten in regard to this. We, we really are. Our lives would drastically change if tonight when we got ready to leave, we exited those doors and we got beat by the government because we had assembled together. Our lives would very much change. And I, I'm thankful for the liberties that we have, but I wonder if the day is coming. I've noted this with you before. I think it's part of the reason why God continues to pave the way for us to meet together so that we would, so that we would be prepped for some things that could unfold in the future. Although we have an our, our eye to the sky and we've just been re-impressed with the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is poised and ready to return, but I'm telling you that God's people are being persecuted all around the world and especially more so now in this country in which we live. The Thessalonians were, were, were abounding in, in the realm of persecution. They, they, they were marked by patience. They were marked by perseverance through any and all persecution. And here's the segue then to this. That's the segue to this, that you realize, don't you? I know you do. That there's an entire doctrine dealing with God's people being persecuted for righteousness sake. An entire doctrine. And, and we'll close in just a few minutes being reminded of some of the texts that come into play with that. But I wanted to note with you 
And all of this is spurred on by our study here in 2 Thessalonians, and specifically what Paul writes in verse 5, as he continues to commend the church in Thessalonica for their perseverance through and in the persecution that they were facing. There are two things, I love this, there are two things that come into play with the doctrine of God's people being marked by patience in persecution. And with these two things, there's both a now and later. The first is our persecution, you know this well, it's a reminder for you tonight. The first is that I... Our persecution, when we are persecuted for righteousness' sake, and I'm telling you that I think we are being persecuted only minimally, but there's something inseparably linked to the persecution of God's people for righteousness' sake, and that thing that it's inseparably linked to is eternal reward. And I love this because we've been talking about faith and love and patience. And here we're talking about patience enduring through persecution. And I love how faith comes into play again with that. Because the the only way that God's promise of eternal reward to you is going to motivate you is if you believe in something that you have not seen. And that is one of the definitions of faith, right? That's Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And what class? The evidence of things not seen. And this is amazing to me. At every turn, God is reminding us that if we suffer well, that linked to that is eternal reward. And God anticipates that you and I will be so motivated by that that we will come very close to what marked the church in Thessalonica. And that is where they were abounding through the thing. But it requires faith. And it pertains to the future. God promises in the future eternal reward. And I've, I've talked to you about this before. I, there, there's some with false piousness who say, oh, we ought not to be thinking about reward. And I realize that we can look at rewards and use them for an improper motive for loving and serving the Lord. But you know, because we've studied through this, you know that a proper view of eternal reward is inseparably linked to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you and I love Christ, we are going to be very, very interested in being eternally rewarded. So when God says, hey, if you do this now, I'll do this for you later, we say, that's good enough for me. But boy, the worldling certainly wouldn't see that. But we're reminded of that tonight here with verse 5. I thought of Romans 8, 18, right? For I reckon Paul writing to the Christians in Rome who were also being persecuted. What church in the early first few centuries of, uh, of the uh, of the uh, of church history, what church wasn't being persecuted for her faith? And I thought of Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in you. God anticipates that you and I are going to be motivated by, by that, that, that we will be eternally rewarded if we suffer for Christ and do so in patience and perseverance. Just like the church in Thessalonica. And then a second thing not only is linked to the biblical doctrine pertaining to the patience of God's people in persecution, not only linked to that is the idea of eternal reward, which is later, but also something now, thus that now and later. And this is so interesting to me. The second thing that's included in the patience of God's people in persecution is nothing short of miraculous. And that is joy. Yes. Inseparably linked 
to the biblical doctrine of the patience of God's people in persecution is a miraculous sense of joy. To help you to appreciate that, and again, this pinches a little bit, but we, we sing often and usually gladly. There, there's joy in serving Jesus, right? We sing, there's joy in serving Jesus. Were we to be honest with each other, we'd have to say, though, before God, man, we struggle even with that. We sing there's joy in serving Jesus, but a lot of times we're missing the joy. Do you want... Do you know what the apostles, the original apostles were singing? Do you know what the church in Thessalonica was singing? There is joy in suffering for Jesus. I don't even fully understand it, again, thus miraculous, that inseparably linked to the idea of suffering for righteousness' sake and doing it well like the church in Thessalonica is one It's linked to eternal reward, which is the later, but there's also a now that it's inseparably linked to a sense of joy. I know God still has to take me somewhere in regard to this. Listen, I am the first to testify to you that I have not arrived. God hears way too much, God God hears way too much murmuring, way too much disputing, way too much complaining for me. There are way too many times where I'm bucking against what God is doing in my life and thus not marked by joy. But the Christians in Thessalonica were. I was uh, reading in regard to this, and you're so familiar with it, and Boy, if you're wondering where to go tomorrow morning devotionally, just start working through the first part of the book of Acts. We have the people initially waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit of God, Pentecost. Then we have Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit actually comes. And then we have persecution. Absolutely amazing. And I just read this, I believe it's Acts 5 and maybe down to verse 41, where the apostles and the succinctness of the text is just amazing to me. Where, where Dr. Luke is recording, and he says the, the apostles, again, this is saying this, he says the, the apostles were arrested and beaten because they're preaching Christ. He says the apostles were arrested, beaten, and commanded to silence, and that didn't work. But he succinctly says the, the apostles were arrested, beaten, commanded to silence, and released. And then this interesting little commentary and they departed rejoicing that they had been worthy to suffer for the sake of Christ. We got a ways to go, right? But would you join me in desire? That's what I want to say to God tonight. God, I, I'm, I'm probably not there, but I want to get there. Would you help me to get there? so that my life is marked not only by joy in serving Jesus, and I need to work even on that, but beyond that my mark would be, that my life would be marked by joy in suffering for Christ. Because there have been people, many down through the ages, and even presently, who count it a privilege to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't that help you? I'm speaking personally. Doesn't that help you? Doesn't that help me with these little tidbits of suffering that we have? Don't you just think, boy, God, you're going to be able to help me to handle these things a lot better. And in the process, you're going to be paving the way for me to be prepared for something that's bigger. I told you that we're going to take a quick biblical journey. I think we need to do it in 90 seconds. We start off. You ready? You got your Bibles? It's a Bible drill. Uh, We we start out with Matthew chapter 5, verses 11, 12. Just so that you see that we're not gleaning uh, this only from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, that this is a Bible-wide presentation. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. I think almost everything we look at, and we're going to do so very quickly, uh, it it will be a, a simple reminder to you. This is Christ's Sermon on the Mount, as you know, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Do you remember this? Blessed are you 
when men shall revile you and persecute you and so say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. God, you're talking to us about that again? For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they, the prophets who were before you. Take a look at Philippians 1.29. Again, it's a Bible drill, right? Philippians 1.29. And I got to do one semantic thing for, with you here, and then two other texts, and then I'll say goodbye. Philippians 1 and 29. Go, go, go. For unto you it is given in behalf, in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. I got I, I to do one semantical thing with you. Verse 29, the first part, for unto you it is given. The Greek word, charizomai. What does that mean? Grace, grace, grace. It is the Greek word for gift. Paul, writing to the Philippi Christians, says... I want you to know it is a gift that you are suffering for Christ's sake. Take a look at 1 Peter 3.14. 1 Peter 3.14. But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be ye Troubled, and of course, verse 15 is very familiar uh, to you. Uh, flip over one page to chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. I leave you with this. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. In other words, you'll never regret that. You can receive it as a gift. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the spirit of God, for the spirit of glory and of God rest, rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. I'm mumbling through that because we see our two things here. Eternal reward later and joy now. It's a prominent theme. I, I, I know I haven't arrived, but I know that I want to. God help me, and God help you. So here it is. How's our faith? How's our love? And especially tonight, how's our patience? Let's pray together. God, thank you for these considerations. We love everything you do with us through your word, and here you are prepping us again. I mean, we, we certainly... I do some suffering. I'm not uh, ignoring that. And, and certainly some of our suffering is significant, although we, we've been prompted to recognize, even together as a church, that much of our suffering is not for Christ's sake. It's suffering that we've brought on to ourselves but you've got a good word for us when and if we do suffer for Christ's sake. And your good word is full, but funnels down to two things. One, you speak often to us of the eternal reward that's linked to it. And then you offer to us now. And it's a miracle. Joy. I know the original disciples and apostles had it. I pray that I would too. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to number 56. Number 56. God will take care of you. Let's stand together. In closing, number 56.
will take